All right, everyone. Hello and welcome to the meeting. Thank you all for coming. You can tell how important this meeting is because I have not one, not two, not three, not four, but five anime figurines and a brick behind me. This is an extremely portentous meeting with some serious business, all right? Today we will be looking at some of the most wanted men in the entire world. I would say if you see any of these criminals to run for the hills, but honestly, you're not going to make it that far. First off, we have Monkey D. Lu Luffy. He's going to be the king of the pirates someday, or so our intelligence specifies. Also, these wanted posters are a little bit out of date, but his current bounty is a lot higher than this. How higher than this? I don't know. We'll talk about that later. But next, we have... Eustace Captain Kid, also extraordinarily dangerous, but not as dangerous as the next individual, Trafalgar D. Waterlaw, who has a funny hat, so pay attention to that hat. But none of these dastardly criminals are even close to approaching the sheer temerity and pain that this next individual can cause. May I reveal to you the world's most wanted man... Mr. Three Galdino, apparently! That was supposed to be Buggy's poster, but apparently Mr. Three managed to worm his way in instead. Alright, fine, we'll roll with it. You see this man coming, you run! You flee! You figure out extra-dimensional travel! You escape our timeline! For God's sake, he's got a three on his head! Ugh, I, I apologize, but uh, really, if you see Mr. Three, you should run. He can turn you into a wax sculpture. That's not a fun time. All right, so yes, today we are going to be looking at bounties. This is a little bit of a rush video, to be honest with you. Uh, I'm really busy for the rest of the day, but I did have to get a video out, so I decided to talk about bounties, because everybody loves to talk about bounties, right? Today we are going to be looking at the top 10 highest bounties in One Piece, all right? Now, the thing is, I had to make certain judgment calls with certain characters, because there are are characters whose status in the series right now is is sort of questionable whether or not they're still around, whether or not their bounties are active. Rather, like, Oda has never came out and said that their bounty is officially rescinded or it's been, like, frozen or anything like that. So, to just clarify a few things right here out of the gate, I am not including Kaido or Big Mom on this list, alright? We still do not know about their status. They fell down the hole. Uh, they got thrown into molten lava, which, I gotta be honest with you, with, like, Oda with that decision, was beautiful because a lot of people were wondering like okay are, are they just gonna die at the end of Wano is Kaido just gonna get killed by Luffy and then we don't have to worry about him for the rest of the story and because uh, that's a little weird you know Luffy doesn't straight up usually kill the enemy of an arc what about Big Mom are they just gonna kill her like what's gonna happen to them right and so Oda's solution to that problem was like oh, I'm just gonna drop him into a volcano I'd be like yeah, okay. Yeah, no, seriously, that usually tends to, you know, fix the problem, right? It's like, yeah, I'm not gonna straight up kill them, I'm just gonna drop them into a volcano. 99% of the time when you drop an anime villain into a volcano, it usually tends to work to hold them off for a little while. In case you're curious, the 1% chance where it doesn't work is Cars from JoJo Part 2. Cars! Ooh! Anyway, um, so yeah, I'm not including Kaido or Big Mom because I don't think they're currently around at the moment. They might be still alive, but maybe in a coma or something. Uh, their crews are definitely in ruins, like both of their crews are right now. Uh, the Beast Pirates were absolutely devastated during the war at Onigashima, and the Big Mom Pirates are also probably not doing all that well, considering the whole thing with the Germa way back at, you know, Whole Cake, and that was left kind of like up to Katakuri and Oven, but then the German managed to escape and then there was a bunch of the Big Mom Pirates that attacked Wano. It's like they're kind of scattered right now, so I'm not including them. Uh, and we also got two new Yonko on the block anyway in Luffy and Buggy, all right? So, you know, I, maybe Big Mom and Kaido are still going to pop up at some point, but I think Oda's going to take them out of the story for a little while there. Um, also, I, I not, I'm not including Queen or King because they were also captured, thrown in the Udon prison, and then... We don't know. I guess Aramaki did not, like, bring them in, but Aramaki attacked them at the Udon prison and defeated them both and, like, drained all the nutrients out of Queen and everything like that. And, and I'm assuming they're still in the prison, okay? So, yeah, I mean, like, I don't think uh, Green Bull grabbed them and, like, dragged them into Impel Down after he was kind of scared with Shanks' as hockey, so he kind of just left Wano. Uh, but they were clearly defeated, and they're currently in prison. So I'm not going to count their bounties either, all right? So... With that being said, the number 10 bounty in the One Piece world right now total 
is actually very apropos because it's actually Jinbei, the 10th member of the Straw Hat crew. So that worked out rather well. So Jinbei's current bounty is 1,100,000,000, all right? Uh, up from his former bounty, which I believe was 470,000,000. Uh, so it's definitely gotten a big bump since then. And, you know, considering the fact he's a former warlord and everything, and now he's a member of a Yonko crew, you can definitely tell they uh, upped his bounty quite high. So uh, the way it normally worked is Luffy had the highest bounty in the crew, and then the second and third bounties were usually Zoro or Sanji. In one rare case, it went Sanji and then Zoro. Uh, but in this case, it's actually now Luffy, then Zoro has the second highest bounty, and now Jinbei has the third highest bounty. Sanji has the fourth, okay? Um, so there's a little bit of a debate here, you know, whether or not we have a new monster trio now, or if you want to say monster quartet, uh, whatever, what have you. I mean, we still have a lot of really strong characters on the uh, Straw Hat crew. Uh, I don't really think Sanji would be so upset with uh, Jinbei, though. You know, Sanji, I don't think, is going to argue with Jinbei. It's the whole thing is Sanji and Zoro. So if anything, they're going to argue back and forth, even though, you know, Z Zoro actually might approach it from that angle. You know, Sanji goes up to him. He's like, hey, damn, Moss Head, what the hell's up with this bounty? You know, I was higher than you at one point. Don't you forget. And then Zoro could just sitting there and he'd just be like, hey, man, don't take it up with me. You know, before you argue with anybody, you're number four. I'm number two. You got to go through number three before you can even argue with me. And then Jibei's off to the side and he's like, I'm not involved in any of this. I don't know why you guys care about bounties so much. <laughs> you know what? That would be... <laughs> okay. You know how, like, when... Because Jinbei is sort of like the dad of the crew right now. We saw that during Egghead when he's walking out in the Hawaiian shirt and, you know, Luffy and Chopper are, like, exploring the island and Jinbei's like, all right now, kids, just hold on now. We'll all get a chance to see the amusement park, you know? So Jinbei's kind of like the dad of the crew. This would kind of remind me of a situation where I never had brothers, but if you do have brothers, like, you, let's say you're arguing over something like a trading card game or a video game, growing up, and uh, do you ever have a moment where your dad was just kind of like, he didn't get it, so he's just like, why are you arguing about this? Can't you just share the controller? I don't understand why this is such a big deal, right? I can see that sort of being like, Dad, you don't understand! That's the kind of the same thing with Jinbei, where you have Zoro and Sanji arguing about bounty numbers, and Jinbei's just off to the side like, guys, is it really that big of a deal? Like, we're all criminals here. Like, why do you why do you want there to be a bigger bounty on your head? I just, it doesn't make any sense to me. That's a dangerous thing for our bounties to be higher, you know? And I, I don't know, I could just see, like, Jinbei not wanting to get involved in the conversation at all. He has an over one billion berry bounty, but he's not, like, overly proud of it. He's not, like, looking at his bounty poster with pride of just, like, Oh, yes, thank God, Fisher Tiger, I'll live up to your memory. Like, I don't think he's gonna do that or anything. I think he just looks at it like, yeah. Yeah, I'm a pirate. Yeah, that's a big number. Okay. Uh, moving on, though, number nine, we have uh, Zoro. Roranora Zoro with a bounty of 1,111,000,000. I remember back when the first translation of this came out and it was erroneously printed as something like 1 billion 11 million or like 11,000 like they messed up the ones so Zoro's bounty has a lot of ones it has four ones in it okay it's kind of more like binary code I guess a lot of them like gene base could be binary code as well but yeah even though Zoro's bounty has been corrected now it's still only 11 million berries higher than gene base so in case you were ever curious of what the difference in power between Jinbei and Zoro was it's about 11 million. <laughs> now, of course, bounties don't represent power levels or anything like that. That would just be silly. Um, although it does bring up, like, who exactly decides bounties for Yonko crews, because that's what the Straw Hats are now. They're officially an Emperor crew. Um, and, like, because when it comes to a lot of the pirates in the world that are, like, small fry, I imagine, like, lower-level intelligence operatives in the Marines, like, brand new, he's the one that might decide the bounties for, like, random riffraff pirates. But when it comes to Yonko bounties, I feel like they're probably going to give that job of deciding those bounties in the government to someone with a little bit higher status. Maybe not necessarily the Gorosei, although, I mean, like, the Gorosei have to be doing something. What do they do in their room of authority all day? Just sit around and sip tea? You know, maybe it's like, okay, you have four different bounties you need to decide on, Gorosei. I'd be like, oh, man, it's a hard day today. He's like, wow, it's really tough doing this, ruling the whole world and everything in Eam's shadow. All right, all right, what's Buggy's bounty's going to be? What's Luffy's bounty going to be? 
be. So if not the Goro, say maybe Kong. Kong is like the supreme commander of the Marines, the Cypher Pole, and the Warlords were formerly the Warlords. So maybe Kong decides that's what he does. Um, but yeah, anyway, so yeah, that's Zoro's current bounty, only 11 million higher than uh, Jean Bay's, okay? And uh, Sanji didn't even make the list, so that makes Zoro pretty damn happy. Okay, moving on to number eight. This was one... That was a little bit contentious, because like I said, I, I took out Kaido and Big Mom. I also took out King and Queen and Jack and all the, the commanders of their crews. Um, with number eight, I decided to go with Marco. Yeah, I went with Marco because Marco, uh, he's not captured by the Marines or anything. Yeah, he is technically retired, but he's still a former member of the Whitebeard crew. And I don't think they would just, like, rescind his bounty. So Marco has a bounty of 1,374,000,000. All right, it's pretty high. And he's, like, on Sphinx Island right now. And I can't imagine the Marines would just kind of, like, ignore him. You know what I mean? Like, if they have a chance to bring in Marco the Phoenix, the former first mate and the first division commander of the Whitebeard crew, they're probably going to do that. Although right now Marco decides to stay out of the spotlight, so he's not really active doing stuff stuff, but his bounty's still active. Same thing technically with Rayleigh. If we actually knew Rayleigh's bounty, I would have put him on this list as well, except we just don't. Um, obviously, he would be somewhere on here. Maybe he might be number... I don't know if he'd be number one, but he would definitely be in the top three, whatever Rayleigh's current bounty is. Um, but yeah, Marco is number eight, okay? Uh, moving on to number seven, and I'm really glad she's on this list. We have Boa Hancock. Boa Hancock's current bounty is 1,659,000,000. Of course, she was a former warlord. Her bounty was frozen when she was a warlord. Lord, but now it's reactivated, and I also think increased, uh, well, definitely increased, because uh, her former bounty was one of the lower ones in the Warlords. I think um, it was only like 80 million. I think Crocodiles was 81, and Boas was 80. I think she had the lowest frozen bounty out of all of the Warlords, which doesn't necessarily mean she's weak. Um, same thing with Crocodile. A lot of people were like, well, Crocodile had a bounty of only 81 million, and then when he got, you know, reactivated as a pirate, now it's like one of the highest in the entire world. What's up with that? And the situation of what's up with that really is just it determined it's just determined by when they became warlords okay in the case with boa she became a warlord pretty much right after she became the empress of the kuja which is like 13 years ago so i think she just basically went off on maybe one or two expeditions as the captain of the kuja you know maybe doing a few pirating raids and then just from that danger alone also it was mentioned that because of the former empress that sort of reputation that carried over to boa the government decided to invite her to the warlords relatively quickly. So she made a little bit of a name for herself. She got like that 80 million was probably the first bounty she was issued, which 80 million as a starting bounty, that's nothing to, you know, sneeze at. But as soon as she was issued that starting bounty, the government probably approached her and was like, okay, would you like to join the warlords? And probably through some coaxing with the other Kuja, she decided to accept because it would help protect Amazon Lily and everything. So yeah, her bounty wasn't that impressive at the very beginning, but she was literally just getting started with her pirating career. Then it was frozen for like 13 years and then deactivated now and then reassessed. And with all of her, you know, the, the power of the Kuja, she has her to disposal, her whole island. She's got the Mara Mara no me. At not the Mara Mara no me, the Mellow Mellow no me. So like the Mellow Mel, the Love Love Fruit. She has the Love Love Fruit. Taking all that into consideration, she has a bounty of 1,659,000,000. Uh, she's still around. She's on Amazon Lily. She was almost captured. She almost had her Devil Fruit stolen by Blackbeard. Thankfully, Rayleigh showed up at the last minute to save her. Uh, but yeah, I think that Bo is going to have a lot more problems because, um, you know, marine battleships are perfectly capable of reaching the island. And yeah, it all kind of went... Uh, horrible this time around. It didn't really work out because the Marines invaded, but so did Blackbeard, and then Rayleigh showed up, so everybody just sort of left the island, and Rayleigh and Shockey are still there right now, kind of hanging out on Amazon Lily, waiting for them to come back in case anything happens again. Um, but yeah, we gotta wait to see, but honestly, like, I don't think the Marines are just going to let Boa go. Um, as soon as they're aware that, like, Rayleigh's no longer involved or something, they're, they're going to try again. Probably gonna be a while until 
until they try again. But I would assume with at least the way it's structured right now, with Akainu being the fleet admiral and the Gorosei and Eam and everything like that, if things stayed the same, they would eventually go after Boa once more, okay? However, we're kind of like in endgame One Piece right now, so it's very likely that by the end of the story, you know, that we might not have to worry about that. Boa might not have to worry about Marines coming to her island anymore because, you know, there might be this massive reform, you know, Eam might be dethroned, the Gorosei might be disposed of, the revolution occurs and everything, and who knows what the government's, like, the structure of it's going to look like after that. So, moving on now, we have the sixth highest bounty in the story, who is Sir Crocodile with a bounty of 1,965,000,000. I just noticed, after looking at these bounties side by side, so first of all, like I said, Boa and Crocodile both had relatively low bounties. Uh, I might be mixing them up. I always mix them up, because one of them has an 81 million at the starting bounty, and another had an 80 million. I, I think that Crocodile had the... Wait, did Crocodile have the 81 million, and Boa had the 80? I forget. It doesn't matter. It's a difference of 1 million. No one cares. But um, it's also interesting that they had a very similar bounty there. Then, and they also have very similar bounties now, because Boa's is 1,659,000, and Crocodile's is 1,965,000, so it's the same numbers just mixed around, just flipped around. I find that really funny. So, yes, Sir Crocodile, a uh, founding member of the Cross Guild. Of course, he's not the leader of the Cross Guild, ladies and gentlemen. That's Buggy D. Clown, of course. But still, a bounty of almost 2 billion. And by the way, I was looking through the numbers, I don't think there's any character in the story that has an active bounty of 2 billion, or in the 2 billions right now. It jumps from Crocodiles at 1.9 billion all the way into 3 billions after this. Because uh, Blackbeard's bounty was in the 2 billions, but that got raised, okay? Uh, there's still probably some pirates out there somewhere, maybe some people on, like, Shanks' crew that have, like, a 2 billion. Maybe Ben Beckman might have, like, a 2 billion berry bounty or something. We just don't know yet. Um, this is just in the story right now as of January 14th, 2023. Uh, but anyway, yeah. So, Crocodile... I I'm really excited to see him back in action, all right? This was a character that a lot of people liked. A lot. He was a fan favorite or a fan villain you love to hate back at Alabasta. And now he's returned to the story. I love the fact that Oda doesn't just, like, you know, after a villain is defeated, they just get taken out of the story and they're never going to show back up again. Or if they do show back up again in the story, they're more of just, like, a joke or something like that. Um, there's a lot of debate, of course, you know, like, oh, did, did Crocodile not know hockey back then? You know, he didn't even know hockey. How could he be strong now? It's like... Two years have passed. We saw how much stronger the Straw Hats have gotten in two years. Also, Crocodile really just speaks to me as a character that learns from his mistakes and doesn't repeat them, okay? He's made a lot of mistakes, don't get me wrong, but he learns from each one. So, at the beginning of Crocodile's journey, he was inspired by the execution of Goldie Roger to go out to sea to become the King of the Pirates. And we actually knew that that was his dream, because during Miss Golden Week's Meet Baroque, when she uses the, the rainbow colors trap, uh, it reveals the characters, like, the greatest dream, their dreams that they have, right? And it's like, Mr. One turns into a superhero because he always wanted to be a superhero. And then Crocodile gets, like, a pirate crown and stuff. Like, he's king of the pirates now. So that was, and probably still is, Crocodile's dream. So he went out to sea to just become king of the pirates. He fought against Whitebeard. Whitebeard beat the crap out of him. I'm assuming that's where he lost his hand and got the hook and everything. So then he was like, okay, I'm going to try a new tactic. I'm not going to try to just become a pirate and just sail the world. I'm going to try to build up this criminal organization known as Baroque Works, get my hand hands on Pluton, and then I'll make the game. I'll, I'll make the push for becoming King of the Pirates. And he tried that, and that didn't work. So, he's tried two different approaches to this. Neither of them really worked. So, his current approach is not to just dive right in to be a pirate on the high seas, and also not to build up this criminal organization. It's to ally himself with extremely powerful warriors that are also maybe at odds with the government, to, to build, like, the best of the best. With Baroque works, it was more uh, quantity over quality. Now it's more quality over quantity. All right? So it's like he approaches Mihawk, and he's like, hey, Mihawk, how about we work together? Okay, that's his new approach. And I bet you he's been really training seriously these past two years. He's got hockey. He's powerful. He's improved his Logia powers and everything like that, if he could even get stronger with those. Um, I think Crocodile will be a very formidable opponent in the uh, upcoming arcs, definitely. Right, number five. Okay, so number five 
five is actually tied for three different characters, okay? We got Monkey D. Luffy, we got Eustace Captain Kid, and we have Trafalgar D. Waterlaw. They all have the exact same bounty of three billion, except Luffy's is special, because even though he has the same bounty as Law and Kid, Luffy's the one that becomes an emperor, and Law and Kid kind of don't. That must be awkward to have the same bounty as an emperor, but not be considered an emperor, all right? This was something that was, like, honestly a point of contention for a long time. Like, in the fan base, it was, like, just accepted, that, like, you can't have the same bounty as an emperor. You know, that doesn't make any sense to have the same bounty as an emperor, but not be considered an emperor. Well, <laughs> welp, uh, Oda kind of just shot that down right quick, <laughs> all right? Um, so, I don't know. I mean, I guess if you just want to go by bounties alone, and if it's like, hey, if Luffy's considered an emperor, then Law and Kid should also be considered emperors. The five, em no, the six emperors, I can count. Man, I had to do a video in a hurry. I pick a rush video, and the topic involves math. What's wrong with me? All right, the, the topic is light basic math. Oh, God. <laughs> all right, anyway. But we have the six emperors, I guess, okay? So yeah, they all have a bounty of three billion because they all work together to defeat Kaido and Big Mom at Wano, and, and that's what they have right now. Uh, we're also probably going to focus on them a lot more. See, their reward for getting the three billion berry bounty is not necessarily to become a Yonko. Their reward is we focus on them more in the story now. So we got to see what Kid's doing, he's up to, he's going to uh, Elbaf, and Law is, of course, fighting Blackbeard right now, and Luffy's on a Head Island with the Straw Hats and Vegapunk, okay? So we're going to be focusing on all three of these crews relatively simultaneously, concurrently with the arcs moving forward, okay? But other than that, I think we all know about Luffy and Law and Kid. They're pretty prominent characters in the story. So moving on, we now have the number four highest bounty in the entire story. Buggy D. Clown. It is no longer Buggy the Clown. It is Buggy D. Clown. Come at me. Let's fight. I mean, come on now. It's Buggy D. Clown, all right? Oh, my God. Buggy has a bounty of 3,189,000,000. Never thought I'd see the day, ladies and gents. Never thought I'd see the day. The Clown Star would rise from the ashes. You know, Marco's the phoenix? No, Buggy is the true phoenix. Like a phoenix! Okay, so, uh, Buggy, through a series of wacky coincidences, <laughs> uh, has now become the, uh, effective leader or figurehead or puppet king. He's the puppet king of the Cross Guild, essentially. Just, honestly, he got that bounty because there was a printing mishap in his crew. Because it was like, okay, they're going to form the Cross Guild. Buggy, I guess, borrowed some money from Crocodile. And they were like, hey, give us the cash, clown. We need a little bit of a startup operation, right? So Buggy sort of offers them his, his island and his crew and everything like that. And he really didn't have anything else to, you know, present. Because he didn't really have a lot of the other money. I guess he spent a lot of it. And so Crocodile and Mihawk were like, yeah, all right, fine. We'll take your operation here. I guess we can use you. I guess you're, you're useful in that front. Except when uh, Buggy's delivery service were printing out... Out the flyers they put buggy right in the center so the whole world began to think like oh buggy must be the one in charge of this and crocodile and mihawk are under him okay which made them rather upset because that's like their reputation on the line now is like you're not gonna boss us around clown but also mihawk was pretty intelligent here he was like well wait, wait a second hold on after i'm actually thinking about it a bit um it might actually be useful to have buggy as the leader to make everyone think he's the leader because if they come after us and if it's a choice between coming after Buggy or coming after Mihawk and Crocodile, they're going to go after Buggy because he's the leader. He has the highest bounty. or the, He's the emperor, so to speak. He doesn't have the higher bounty than Mihawk, but he, he's the emperor, okay? So in that situation, they're like, okay, yeah, I guess we can roll with that. And so that's where we're at right now. Uh, Buggy, though, I, I feel bad for him because even though he is an emperor, this is like way more infamy than I think Buggy ever wanted. I think he kind of settled into his spot as a warlord because he's like, okay, I'm backed by the government now. Everything should be safe and secure. I have my own little island, Kalibali Island. I have my crew. Everybody listens to me. I have a decent amount of money. Um, everything's good. Everything's cool. I'm all right with this, like this state. Ability. But now he's an emperor, 
And this is like, like he grew up on Roger's crew. He knows all about emperors. He knows all about how they fight and how strong they are. And Buggy knows 157%, weird number, but he knows 157% that he is not an emperor. He is not as strong as Roger or Whitebeard in his prime or Kaido or Big Mom or Mihawk or Crocodile. He knows he's not nearly as strong as any of these characters, and yet he's an emperor. So I don't know if Buggy's going to try to just kind of weasel his way out of this, like just try to escape or fake his death or something. That honestly might be the best move he could make. Or if he's going to try to roll with it and just be like, all right, I didn't expect this to happen, but... I guess I'm an emperor now. All right, everyone, men, bow down before Emperor Buggy. Aha, except for you, Crocodile and me. Hawk, you, you don't need to bow down to me, but uh, they, yeah, is it okay if I tell them to bow down to me? It is? Okay. Bow down to me! And then Crocodile and Mihawk are just like, oh my god, this idiot. But it's like, okay, I guess he could be useful, sure. Alright, so that's the situation. What's up with Buggy right now? I, we wish him the best, you know what I mean? Alright, third highest bounty in the story. Um, we have Mihawk. Dracul, strongest swordsman in the entire world, Mihawk. He's got a bounty of 3,590,000,000. And that's not even his bounty. That's just the bounty of Yoru. Um, actually, you know, that's a joke, but legitimate question. Like, what would Yoru's bounty be? What happens if somebody actually manages to get Yoru away from Mihawk and tried to, like, give it to the government? Like... I feel like they would give them some money for that, right? Like, at least, like, a billion berry bounty for Yoru. Although, there's, like, a bad side to that, too. Because, like, imagine if you got your hands on Yoru, and you gave it to the government, and you're like, I got my hands on Dracul Mihawk's sword. You'd look at that, and you'd be like, are you insane? You stole Dracul Mihawk's sword? He's going to be coming here, and he's going to level this entire... He's going to level all of Marine HQ to get this back, you idiot. Take it away from us. We don't want this here. All right? You know, it's like they somehow managed to steal it from Mihawk while he was sleeping. He wakes up like, oh, what the hell? He just storms into Marine Ford with his little, like, pendant cross necklace knife thing, and he starts slicing up everything and just, like, give it back. I'm like, yeah, sure, okay, yeah, here you go, here you go. And it's just like, okay, I don't know how you stole it from me. It's like you go to steal, it's like you're a really, you're a skilled thief, and you go to steal it from Mihawk, and you're like, I, I want to steal Dracul Mihawk's sword. It's like, okay, uh, roll me, roll me stealth with disadvantage. Be like, double crit. Son of a bitch! Okay! Fine, you steal Dracul Mihawk's sword. Roll me stealth again to get away from here without alarming him. With disadvantage. Another double crit. Oh, okay, fine, you steal the damn sword. You have Mihawk's sword now. <laughs> Can you get away with it? Oh, man. But anyway, yeah, so Mihawk. Funny thing is, yeah, Mihawk has a higher bounty than Buggy. Higher bounty than um, two of the emperors. Uh, so he could easily be considered an emperor himself. But he doesn't have a crew. So, I mean, I guess he technically has a crew right now with the Cross Guild. But he doesn't have, like, a proper crew of his own. So uh, maybe that's why they're not considering an emperor. Also, his temperament. He doesn't really want to be an emperor. He's the greatest swordsman in the world, though. So they have to give him a high bounty. Like, they have to, okay? You cannot do the best swordsman in the world justice... And I think they even mentioned when they were announcing him that he was, like, a better swordsman of Shanks, or he, like, bested Shanks or something like that, or at least on the par with Shanks. So you can't just not give him a high bounty, right? So 3,590,000,000 Dracul Mihawk, greatest swordsman in the world. He's finally doing stuff in this story. We're going to finally see him bust out this sword and fight full power, and I cannot wait for it, okay? Moving on, the number two highest bounty in the world is another emperor, and this is Blackbeard, Marshal D. Teach, with a bounty of 3,996,000,000. <laughs> very, very close to 4 billion, which is also very, very close to Shanks' bounty, uh, which is the highest bounty in the series. But talking about Blackbeard really quick here, um, Blackbeard is pretty dangerous. <laughs> He's got the power of the Yami Yami Nomi. He's got the power of the Guru Guru Nomi. And um, I would say he would pose a really great threat in this story. I, I really would, except, um, well, Garp's coming to town now. Garp's coming to kick his ass. Um, I'm sorry. Like, Blackbeard's not going to make it out of here alive. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Let's let's roll this back a little bit here so I can talk about this again. All right. 
Um, just to go over some stuff, because I made a whole video about this like two weeks ago. I talked about Garp attacking Blackbeard, and I'm like, man, Garp's really going to mess up Blackbeard, man. I mean, Blackbeard is all a close-range kind of fighter, and uh, yeah, I think Garp is going to wreck his day. And uh, there, there was a fair amount of comments that were like, oh man, hey, Tekking, I love Garp and everything, but I think you're going a little bit too strong on Garp right now. I think you're not really uh, appreciating Blackbeard as much. And I'm like, dude, I'm sorry. I'm completely swept up in this endgame One Piece crap. It's now! This is the moment! This is the moment where Garp finally does stuff! He's rolling up to fight Blackbeard, for God's sake, alright? Yeah, yeah, he's old. I'll give it to you, he's old. But I would argue that he is the most- he is the strongest old person in One Piece right now. Stronger than Rayleigh, because Rayleigh's retired, he hangs out all day and drinks and gambles. He probably does some light exercises to stay in shape. But Garp's still an active member of the Marines. He works out constantly. He's constantly punching the- the giant, like, you know, he, I don't even know how Garp would train, man. I mean, like, I said in that video, he, like, punches mountains. That, that might actually be, maybe not mountains, but for, like, his workout routine every morning, he punches giant boulders or something. That's probably what he's been doing for 50-plus years. Um, there were a few people that said that, like, hey, Garp is not going to be able to beat Blackbeard easily because Blackbeard's not going to fight fair, right? Blackbeard's not going to fight fair, teching. That's not how he fights. He's a Yonko. He's devious, okay? He's going to, like, stab Garp in the back. To which, I have to reiterate, what is Garp's job? What is Garp's job? Garp's job is a Marine, a Vice Admiral of the Marine, mind you. It's like, okay, how long has he been doing this? We don't know the exact number of years of how long he's been doing this, but he's been doing this for at least 50 years, 50 plus years. He's been a Marine, okay? And what do Marines typically do? Fight pirates, okay. How do pirates typically fight? DIRTY! Okay? But Garp, do you not think, do you not think Garp, in his long history of beating the shit out of pirates up and down the Grand Line, Paradise, the New World, and the Four Blues alike, do you not think Garp has seen every single dirty trick, backstabbing maneuver in the book? I mean, it's like Garp wrote the book on this. Okay, well, maybe Garp didn't write the book on dirty tactics. Maybe the pirates of the world, like, wrote the book on dirty tactics. But you guarantee Garp's the one that proofread and peer-reviewed that son of a bitch, okay? Like, he he knows everything about this, okay? He's like, yep, I've, oh yeah, I've seen that one before. Yeah, oh yeah, people have been trying to stab me in the back for years. Oh yeah, that the ambushing tactic? Oh yeah. Oh, oh, they, oh these guys tried to flank me that one time. Oh, that was the one time these, these three pirate crews came together and tried to attack me and destroy me while this other pirate crew came. Oh yeah, I remember that one. He's managed to make it through every single one, guys. Every single one. So I'm just saying, I'm saying, I'm, I'm telling you the Garp hype is real. But anyway, going back, going back to Blackbeard though, he is extraordinarily powerful. And also, it finally seems that whoever is in charge of deciding the bounties, uh, if, at this point, maybe the Gorov say are deciding Shanks and, you know, Blackbeard's bounties or whatever. Um, I would assume that they're finally starting to realize the true danger that Blackbeard poses, especially since he's going around and stealing really powerful devil fruits. He's going, he went to Amazon Lily to try to get Boa's devil fruit. Um, they're aware that he's He's up to a devious plan here. They might also know maybe his connections to rocks because his flagship, he's not exactly hiding it. His flagship is called the Saber of Zebek and Rocks D. Zebek. So maybe the Garbose realize that he has some connection to rocks. Maybe he's Rocks' son or at least following in his legacy or he knows something that rocks did or something like the new rocks of a new generation or something. They're definitely starting to realize how dangerous this guy is and they slap the second highest bounty in the entire world on him right now. So, uh, yeah, fear Blackbeard. If you're, I'll tell you what, I'll make this very easy to qualify, all right? If you're anybody except the absolute strongest characters that have a lot of experience in this story, fear Blackbeard, okay? And I even think, like, Garp knows a little bit about, like, the whole point of, uh, Shanks getting that scar was that he didn't get that scar because he was being careless. It was because Blackbeard has some kind of ability that, you know, allowed him to get that scar, got a one-up on Shanks, even though Shanks was being cautious, okay? So, I'm gonna say Garp is also gonna be cautious here. I don't think he's just gonna, I mean, he said it in kind of a lackadaisical kind of, like, let's just bash some heads and call it a day and rescue Kobe and get out of there. And that might be their overall goal. That is their overall goal, just to get Kobe. So, I mean, like, if they break into Hachinosu and maybe Garp and Blackbeard fight for a little bit, maybe Garp does have the advantage. But it's like, oh, we got Kobe, Captain. We're good. We can escape. And maybe Garp will be like, all right, I'll leave. You know, maybe Garp will flash back to that time that Ace turned back in Marine Fort and got killed by a Kainu. So maybe Garp would be like, all right, I'm not going to make that same mistake. So I'm just going to leave. But Blackbeard, your days are numbered. Actually, a cool way to do this 
have Garp kick the shit out of Blackbeard, have him be on the ground and kind of like losing the fight, and then they ca they get Kobe, and then they retreat, and then maybe you can have a moment where Blackbeard has now experienced the full power of Garp the Fist, and Blackbeard realizes how much he's lacking, and which where he needs to improve, especially which devil fruits he needs to get. So maybe then Blackbeard can hatch a devious scheme of like, oh man, Zeha, that was the true power of Garp the Fist, Garp the Hero. All right, if I'm ever gonna face that man again, I'm gonna need some new devil fruit power, and I know just the one, you know? It might be something like that. It might be a way to get Blackbeard to realize that he's not super powerful, but realizing what he's lacking to get stronger to fight Luffy in the final section of the story. We can go that angle with it. All right, I guess we'll see. And then finally, we have number one, the highest bounty in the story, highest active bounty, not including Kaido and Big Mom because they're in a giant volcano right now. Uh, we have Shanks, red-haired Shanks with a bounty of 4,048,900,000. It's the 489 Shiyanku or Shanks, okay? I would say he was the star of his new blockbuster hit movie, One Piece Film Red, I mean, he did do stuff in the movie. We at least saw how um, his uh, how powerful his conquerors could really be. Uh, Shanks exerting conquerors hockey that's strong enough to knock out even vice admirals, which is very impressive. Um, the only people that were able to resist it were pretty much uh, just the admirals. Just Kizaru and Fuchitora were the only characters able to resist a blast from Shanks' hockey. And I'm still they they even probably still got like goosebumps a little bit, right? So Shanks is wicked strong. Um, the movie didn't really do much to really explore his full power. Uh, we got to see a little bit of how his crew fights, but we didn't really get to see a lot of how Shanks directly fought. Um, you know, but hey, one-handed swordsman and able to do as much damage as he is, and how ha have the uh, pedigree and the status that he has. I mean, it's not to be over oversimplified here, okay? Uh, and yet, still, a lot of people think Shanks is gonna die. I think a lot of people... You know where I think it comes from? I think it comes from a common trope that's in a lot of anime, where in the final saga, you have to have some kind of loss. You know, like, Garp has to die to empower Luffy, or Shanks has to die to inspire Luffy, or something like that, you know? Mihawk has to die to inspire Zoro, like... And I've always felt like... I don't know. Sometimes this is done really well. I mean, there's sometimes in manga and anime that this is done really well. It's a very heartfelt kind of situation. And maybe they run off to fight a battle that they know they cannot win. And they die. And they, uh, you know, they, they pass on their legacy to somebody else. And then other times I just feel like these characters are dying off just because the author feels like they have to die off to inspire the next generation or something. I don't know. Um, I, I just hope Oda is aware of this. Oda is aware of this and is not just going to be like, well, you know, I need to have Blackbeard be scary, so I'm just going to have Blackbeard kill off Shanks or kill off Garp, and then that'll really inspire Luffy. I'm like, I don't really think you need to do that. I don't think it's necessary. I think Luffy hates Blackbeard enough, considering he's the one that captured Ace and turned him in. I think I think Luffy has enough of a reason to fight Blackbeard right now. I don't think Blackbeard needs to kill Shanks or needs to kill Garp in order to make that happen. I also don't think it's maybe necessary for the story, but hey, if Oda writes it in a very good way, where Garp or Shanks fight Blackbeard and they do end up dying, but the way they die is, is, is it makes sense. You know, we find out more about Blackbeard's ability and maybe once we learn about Blackbeard's ability, it makes complete sense on how he was able to cause the shank, uh, the scar on Shanks and how he might be able to defeat Garp or whatever like that. And it's like, okay, all right, the, the writing here is good enough that I'm okay with this trope occurring, but I guess we're just going to have to see where it goes. But anyway, yeah, those are the top ten highest bounties in the story. We got Shanks, Blackbeard, Mihawk, Buggy, Luffy, Law, Kid, Crocodile, Boa, Marco, Zoro, and Jinbei uh, with Luffy, Law, and sharing the same bounty, so there you go. Um, but yeah, I, I know I said I was going to do quail facts today. Sorry, I still haven't gotten it. I just don't have the time. I got to get editing to this, actually. But uh, hey, thanks to everybody for watching the video. This will be Teching 101 signing out. Hope you enjoyed.